let me take some time to explain how brackets work in Einstein notation. Say you have a quantity that looks like aij times bi plus cj plus dk. How do you determine what the free index is and what the dummy index is? Well, here's what you do. In the first step, you look at the term outside the parentheses, the aij, and combine it separately with each of the terms inside the parentheses. You do not multiply them separately and add them because remember, we haven't proven any distributive properties in Einstein notation. All you do is combine them for the purposes of determining what the indices mean. So in this term, you would combine aij and bi first, and in this first combination you can see that the index i occurs twice while the index j occurs once. Then you do the same thing for aij and cj, where the index i occurs once and the index j occurs twice. Finally, you'd repeat this process for the combination of aij and dk, where ij and k each occur once. Now the second step is to combine the largest count of each index from the breakdown in step 1 and use that as the final index count for the purpose of determining whether an index is free or dummy. So in this example, the largest count of i occurs in the first combination, which is just 2, the largest count of j is 2 and occurs in the second combination, while the largest count of k is just 1, which occurs in the third combination. What does this mean? Well, it means that in the overall term, aij times bi plus cj plus dk, i and j are both dummy indices since their overall count is 2 from our analysis, while k is a free index since its overall count is 1. So hopefully that should provide some foundation for how we deal with parentheses and how we distinguish between free and dummy indices when terms in brackets are involved. Let's now solidify our understanding of Einstein notation with some practice examples and light proofs. There are three major non-identities that come up in Einstein notation, and I've listed all of them here. Now I'm not going to rigorously prove these, but I will explain why these non-identities are true, starting with the first non-identity. On the left hand side you have a term involving brackets, so let's apply our bracket analysis to see what indices i and j represent on the left hand term. Again, we combine aij and xi, and then we combine aij and yj. In the first combination, the index i occurs twice and j occurs once, but in the second combination, i occurs once and j occurs twice. The largest count of i from both of these combinations is 2, while the largest count of j is also 2. So therefore, the overall count is 2 for i and 2 for j, which means that i and j are both dummy indices on the left hand side. However, on the right hand side there aren't any brackets involved, so we have to count the indices separately in each term. In the first term i is a dummy index because it occurs twice, and j is a free index because it occurs once. In the second term the opposite is true, so j is a dummy index while i is a free index. This is actually inconsistent with the left hand side where both i and j are dummy indices together, so it makes sense that this would be a non-identity. What about the second non-identity? Why is this true? Well, if you look at the indices, then both i and j are dummy indices on both sides of the equation, so that's not a problem. However, if you look at some scenarios, like, for instance, when you want to determine the coefficient of x1 times y2, then on the left-hand side, that coefficient will just be a12. However, on the right-hand side, because the indices are switched, the coefficient will be a21. And since a12 isn't necessarily equal to a21, this means that the left and right hand sides aren't necessarily equal to each other. If you still aren't convinced by this reasoning, I encourage you to write out all the terms on both sides by supposing that i and j run from 1 to 3 and then show that the two sides of the non-identity are not the same. The third non-identity also follows a similar logic when it comes to the proof. Again, there's no problem with the consistency of the indices, you can verify that both i and j are dummy indices on both sides. However, because aij and aji aren't necessarily equal, you can't add them together to get 2 times aij, especially when you're multiplying that with two different variables with different indices when you're multiplying with xi and yj. Again, I encourage you to write out all the terms on both sides to verify that this is true. In addition to the non-identities in Einstein notation, there's also five identities that I've written here. Again, I'm not going to rigorously prove all these, I'll explain why they're true and hopefully my explanation will give you a better idea of how Einstein notation works. Now this identity is very similar to the first non-identity, the only change is the fact that you have xj plus yj instead of xi plus yj. 
But this difference is enough to make both sides equal. The reason is that unlike the non-identity, the indices on both sides are now consistent. On the left, i is a free index and j is the dummy index, and the same is true for each term on the right. That's why this identity holds true and you can actually prove to yourself that I'm right by assuming that i and j run from 1 to 3 and by expanding out both sides of the identity. Let's now look at the second identity. It's very easy to see why this one is true. All you've done is switch the position of the xi and yj, so obviously since multiplication is commutative, this would hold true. But what about the third identity? Let's look at the left-hand side first. From identity number two, we can change the left-hand side to aij times xj times xi. And this is pretty much the exact same as the right-hand side of the identity, except the indices i and j are switched. But that doesn't really matter since i and j are both dummy indices and as we mentioned in the previous video you can switch the letters representing dummy indices without too much hassle. So therefore, by the transitive property of equality, aij times xi times xj is identically equal to aji times xi times xj. The fourth identity states that aij plus aji times xi times xj is identically equal to 2aij times xi times xj. I'm actually going to prove this identity to show that it's true. We'll start with the left-hand side. Now if we use the rules of Einstein notation and parentheses that I just spoke about, then you can see that both i and j are dummy indices here. That means that i and j are both being summed over. We'll suppose that they're being summed over from 1 to 3, though you could just as easily show this for another range. 1 to 3 tends to just be the most common range in tensor calculus, so that's why I'm sticking with it. Now since i and j are being summed over, we can add these sigmas in front. We can then go ahead and take care of the first summation, and this is what we'll get. Let's now apply the second summation. Now these diagonal terms all come together quite nicely, so you have 2a11 times x1 times x1 and so on. But what about the non-diagonal terms? Well, we can combine them with other non-diagonal terms thanks to the fact that multiplication is commutative. So for instance, a23 down here combines with the other a23 up here, a32 does the same with the a32 up here, and so on until after combining all the like terms and simplifying, this is what you end up with. And if we simplify this by combining the dummy indices and applying the Einstein summation convention, we end up with 2aij times xi times xj, which is exactly the right-hand side of the fourth identity. So therefore, we've proven the fourth identity. Finally, let's look at the fifth identity. For the proof, what we can do is exactly what we did for the fourth identity and expand out the summation that the left-hand side represents. The expanded term will be exactly the same as what we got for the fourth identity, except now the pluses between the a's will get replaced by minuses. And after a whole bunch of simplifying and cancelling common terms, we'll end up with zero. And so we've proven the fifth identity. The last topic in this video is going to be the Kronecker delta symbol. The Kronecker delta symbol is defined as follows using delta ij. And when the index i and j are equal, delta ij is 1. And when they're not equal, delta ij is 0. The Kronecker delta symbol provides an effective way to eliminate off-diagonal terms, and by off-diagonal terms I mean terms where i and j are not equal to each other. And because of this property it comes up a lot in tensor calculus. It should be pretty easy to see from the definition that delta ij and delta ji are both identical. Let's look at a short example involving the Kronecker delta. This example asks us to simplify delta ij times xi times xj. And this is relatively easy, as you know from the definition, delta ij is zero whenever i and j aren't equal, so this means that the only terms remaining from this expression will be when i and j are both equal, and delta ij is one. Therefore, delta ij times xi times xj becomes xi times xi, or xj times xj depending on your preference, according to the definition of the Kronecker delta. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. I've put a link to my Patreon in the description for those who are interested, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.